Hello, this is Jesse Sletton from Empowering Postpartum, and welcome to the Spanglish World Networks on Zingo TV, channels 250 and 251. Please remember to download both the Zingo TV app on the respective app stores on iOS and Android devices. And while you download, make sure to rate and leave a comment. The app is totally free. Zingo TV is also available on Google Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Fire Sticks, Roku and Roku Sticks, and on all smart TVs 2016 and forward. And again, welcome to Empowering Postpartum with me, Jesse Sletton, your postpartum empowerment coach, helping you feel confident, prepared, and holistically supported for your unique journey into parenthood. And on today's episode, we are discussing a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is how to support your partner through postpartum depression. And I'm joined today by licensed marriage and family therapist, husband and father of two, Matthew Manjapani. Good morning, Matthew. Good morning. Almost good afternoon for us here, actually. Oh, that's true. I know. (laughs) There's so many different time zones that I get to speak with wonderful people in. And half the time I'm like, I don't even, I don't even know what time it is. (laughs) Still feels like the morning here. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But we're here, right? So that's all that matters. (laughs) So, um, you know, I I just want to thank you again for joining me today, and I really look forward to shedding light on this really important topic in the realm of perinatal mental health, and um, especially being a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder survivor myself, Um, and I know that you have some personal history with this topic as well. So I think to start us off, I would love for you, if you feel comfortable, uh, to share about your own personal journey, as well as a little bit about the work that you do. Sure. So thank you again for having me. I think it's going to be really wonderful to have this conversation with you, and I'm looking forward to it, too. So I am, as you said, a licensed and marriage family therapist. Um, I work with all different clients from individuals, couples, families of all ages. I have some experience working with foster care kids in the system here, Mm -hmm. teaching independent living skills. Uh, I've worked with with veterans who've been through different conflicts or, or different wars and, and, and have come back with PTSD and, and all these other mm-hmm. issues that um, have affected them so greatly. And I currently also have a private practice where I'm working with specific people uh, for really any issues that come up. And when it comes to depression and postpartum depression, um, we have experienced it ourselves. Uh, I've been mm-hmm. married to my wife, Kimberly, for five years now. It'll be six years mm-hmm. this September. So we're still going strong, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> And we have two little kids. We have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, Michael and Nicholas. And Aww. when we had Michael, we were both in our mid to late 30s when, when we mm-hmm. had him and, and late 30s once we had Nicholas. Um, so it was it was our first child for both of us. And there was a lot that came with it and and a lot of stress and anxiety and, and a lot of symptoms of depression for both of us, but much more for my wife, who was not only experiencing something that I can never say that I've experienced myself personally, Mm -hmm. but had everything involved with the physical and the mental health and the emotional changes that happened going through the entire pregnancy and then everything after Mm -hmm. the fact, it was very challenging for us and and challenging for her. So thankfully we were able to see our way through that, but it was, it was a tough journey and thank God we have wonderful kids now and and we're all on the other side of that, but it was a lot of work that had to go into getting us through that. Yeah, I can imagine. And I think um, when we were kind of doing our, you know, introductions to one another, uh, when you applied to be on the show and everything, you had mentioned that, um, and just the age of your your son, that it was through the pandemic, too, it sounds like. And so that mm-hmm. added, I'm sure, this layer to the complexity of the experience of the postpartum um, journey for both of you. Um, and I know that we saw a lot of spikes um, and we're continuing at a higher level of seeing perinatal mood and anxiety disorders elevated um, since the pandemic. And so I think that this is a topic that's super relevant for many, many new parents. Um, and it's a topic that doesn't get a, discussed as much, I believe, as the actual person experiencing you know, that mood and anxiety disorder, we don't often get to hear the perspective of the partner. And I think that that's why this episode is going to be really special, because I think not only can we kind of give some perspective about what it was like going through that as the partner, and even it sounds like um, experiencing some of your own mental health struggles through that as well. But what we can do as partners to help support our significant other who is experiencing this mental health crisis 
um, and really what we can do to feel more empowered through that and maybe give, get a little bit more hopeful about that we can get on the other side. So um, I'm super excited for us to have this discussion and, um, you know, to kind of open it up, I'd love to get your perspective on what are some things that partners can do to show up and be truly supportive and um, in ways that maybe don't seem as obvious. Because I think in some ways, the way we need to support our significant others who are experiencing this, um, it might be in ways that aren't as intuitive um, for us. Uh, and so I'd love to get your perspective on a couple of tips or, or things that you could call out for these partners who are watching today. Sure, sure. The main takeaway from anything that I discussed too is that not everything happens overnight. These things sometimes yes. take practice, any new techniques or methods or skills that you're learning, nothing happens overnight. You can't pick up a yeah. guitar and suddenly you're a guitar virtuoso <laughs> within 24 hours. I certainly wish right. I was, but I'm not. <laughs> and it, it's the same thing when it comes to any kind of mental health treatment or any kind of activities that you do or, or share with your partner or loved ones, or whoever it is that you're trying to work on these issues with. And yeah. That's something that I always encourage anybody to really keep in the back of their mind because it can get frustrating if you feel like you don't have that progress right off the bat or you feel like you take two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. Think of the positives and the strength. You know, you still took those two steps forward. Even if you fell back a little bit, that's okay. You can always move that course forward a little bit again and get back to where you were and, and even push yourself a little further. I love so, that. Mm -hmm. So when we experienced, and, and you're right, you mentioned that um, our oldest was born right before COVID really kind mm -hmm. of hit everything. He was born in October of 2019, and, and the throes of COVID were really that March. And my yeah. wife had been home with him. Thankfully, she was able to take time off of work and had the first few months alone with him. And then we switched because I had the opportunity with my then position as well. And when I was out with him was when things started to really ramp up. And all of a sudden you're mm -hmm. hearing about everything on the news and these unfortunate deaths and the illnesses and the masking and everything. And mm -hmm. it was funny because at the time I was, I was so involved with raising Michael at the time that I wasn't so aware of everything that was going on. Mm -hmm. And when I returned to work two and a half months later, it was a whole new, whole new world for me that I, I had to yeah. relearn everything. I had to relearn <laughs> how to function in the job and, mm -hmm. and, with that came all of these additional stressors with how to handle raising our child too, because mm -hmm. daycare wasn't really an option at that point. And right. I have family members who could help, but they have their own physical or, or, or medical issues that made it very difficult for them to come over to our house to help us. And yeah. that became a real concern that, that me and my wife, Kim, had to really navigate. And something that we found worked, it, 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 maybe not every single time, but at least as much as mm -hmm. it could help, um, was just being able to step away, just put a pause on things. So mm -hmm. if we're in the middle of a discussion or an argument or, or a disagreement on anything, but particularly during that time, um, trying to navigate taking care of and raising our child in a health, and as healthy, healthily as we could, considering everything right. that was going on, if things would get a little heated or a little emotional, we would just put a pause. Listen, let's just step away for a minute. You go take a walk around the block. She's a big walker. She takes the dogs for walks. You know, that's that's mm. her thing. I think you can see one of the dog's heads behind me, actually. <laughs> Hopefully he stays quiet. Um, for me, I'll put on some music. I'll go sit and like watch a movie for a few minutes or uh, mm. jokingly mention the guitar. But that was for a bit. It was a hobby for me to just take my mind off of things. And then we come yeah. back and reconvene, which mm. is the important thing, too, is coming back and actually attacking whatever the issue is. Yeah. People can get frustrated and walk away and that's the end of it. They'll hang up the phone mm -hmm. or they'll walk out of the house or they'll go take a drive somewhere and then they come back and then the unresolved issues are never resolved. Mm -hmm. And it just builds and builds and builds and oh boy, do you have an explosion later on? Right. So <laughs> what worked for us, like I said, is is saying, let's just take a pause, let's step away. I'm getting upset and and owning those feelings too. Yeah. I'm feeling very frustrated. I'm feeling very upset at whatever is going on. I feel like you're not hearing me. I need to step away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give it five minutes, 10 minutes, come back. Tensions are down a little bit. Your emotions are a little more in check. And then you can really hit those hard conversations a little better. Mm, I really love that because I think we tend to, you know, some of the old advice that I received, right, when I got married was never go to bed angry, never... Mm -hmm. You know, never walk away when things aren't, you know, in a good place. And I think that that's a really harmful advice sometimes because it's like, you know what? Sometimes we need to process what we're feeling and mm -hmm. be able to like recenter, right? And really get into a more present place.
place um, where we can hear what the other person is saying, because like you said, otherwise we can have these explosions that happen. Um, and if we just keep trying to push through it, are we really going to resolve it? Probably not because we're so up here, you know, in our emotional state that it's hard for us to actually think more logically about the other person's perspective or how to say how we're feeling in a way that is heard and received. Because if we're really, you know, up there and we're like very um, nitpicky or we're blaming a lot, right? And we're not owning our own emotion. Um, well, that's a recipe for immediate shutdown, right? Like the other person would be like, mm, no, <laughs> yep. I don't want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> yep. Yep. Goodbye. Yeah. I'm out of here. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> well, I love that piece of advice. Um, and specifically around, you know, the struggles of there's so much that goes into the changes in postpartum, right? For both you know, the birth giver and the partner. And it is from a physical all the way to a, you know, mental, spiritual, even sometimes experience of these identity shifts, the changes in the partnership, the understanding of how to share that parental load, especially for first time parents. Um, and, you know, in my own experience, I feel like that added a lot to my mental health state and understanding like, wow, I had no idea how much this was going to change who I was and make me question about who I was. And then, of course, that made me feel a little bit of distance happening with my husband and I. On top of all the crazy hormonal stuff that was happening, my body needed to heal, right? Mm -hmm. All this insanity. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on how during those times, you know, instead of turning away from one another or feeling like this wedge is being built, instead, how can we turn toward one another and really try to um, grow together through that kind of experience and show up as that supportive presence? We all go through those moments in time where it just feels mm -hmm. so overwhelming and so stressful. And how do we get yeah. through this? And how do I sleep at night? And how do I get up the next morning and do it all again? Right. And it's, it's, important to recognize not only that we're going through this, but that our partner is going through this too, mm -hmm. even if maybe they don't seem it or they don't present it outwardly. There mm -hmm. can be those moments where you're feeling like the world is falling apart and you can't get anything in order. And you look at your partner and, and it's like, oh, they look like they're doing okay. So maybe there's mm -hmm. something wrong with me. I think opening up that communication and making mm. each other aware of what's going on internally is is absolutely paramount to to getting to the root of the problem. When there's that stress level, especially when you're in a in a partnership or have any people who are helping you with with your children, uh, you need to have that open conversation. You need, you need to have that trust and that welcoming conversation. And again, even if you have those negative outbursts, they do happen. Right. And my wife thing, you know, she was willing to uh, allow me to speak about her situation because she did very mm -hmm. much experience the signs of depression and feeling like she was uh, an unfit mother or she wasn't doing mm -hmm. things right. Or even that that Michael wasn't bonding with her, which from my mm -hmm. perspective, I'm looking and seeing the complete opposite. She's right. doing everything she can to care for him. She's getting up in the middle of the night, we would rotate, but we would both be getting up in the middle of the night and changing mm -hmm. him or feeding him or taking care of him. She would do everything that you would expect any new mother to do, almost as if she had the handbook in front of her, which we know doesn't mm -hmm. exist. Uh, <laughs> but in her, in her own mind, she was thinking I was not doing well. I was a failure or I am a failure. Or I'm mm -hmm. not a good mother or it's going to affect him for the next 20, 30 years of his life because I didn't change him fast enough or he was crying while I was holding him and wouldn't settle. And, and it was very tough for her. And I think the the helpful thing was me having some awareness of, of her difficulty so that I knew mm. what was going on and I wasn't mm -hmm. second guessing or I wasn't trying to figure out, you know, the little nuances or read between the lines. She was open with me and, and I was open with her uh, about the times I would struggle too. And, and I think that's what really, helped us connect and and get through some of those really difficult moments, like those waking up every two hour nights that you have for the first few weeks. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> those are <laughs> Oh yeah. Or the naps that won't happen or the fact that, yeah. that after a couple of weeks I had to go back to work. So she was by herself with him throughout the days for those first few months. And that yeah. was a whole new thing. And then again, it, it's more unique to the current times, but having to navigate 
everything with COVID too, and, and worrying about our family members health or anybody who would potentially come and help us, those resources were, were lost. We felt very mm -hmm. isolated and, and detached, even though we can call and video anybody whenever we want, we didn't have them physically present. They weren't here mm -hmm. literally with Michael playing with him or, or, or enjoying him face to face because it just yeah. couldn't happen. So that even further made things harder because we weren't getting that that positive feedback in person from from the people that we really cared and, and trust and love. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I had my second child through the pandemic as well. He was mm -hmm. born in July, 2020. So I had my pregnancy through some of it and then mm -hmm. gave birth. And that was a whole nother level of anxiety inducing issues because we weren't sure like if at one point, you know, was my husband even going to be able to be in the room with me? You know, mm -hmm. I had a doula. Was she going to be able to be there for the birth? There was all these like unknowns. And during a time where it's already so many unknowns, like especially you know, even if you've had another child, each pregnancy, each birth is very different, unique. You know, you're a different person physically each time you carry a new child and you and you give birth. And so there's always these like unknowns and that can really um, affect our mental health in a way because we don't have control in this really big time in our life. Right. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely, I can, I can relate to that feeling of just like isolation and worry about what's going to happen. And, you know, my, my father fell ill with COVID very early on in the pandemic and he was hospitalized. And so that was a whole nother, you know, just worry, like worrying about family members. And it was just a recipe for a really difficult mental health situation <laughs> moving into, yeah. you know, the postpartum time frame. Um, and I think like, even though we're on, you know, the other side of the, the big pandemic time frame. I think a lot of these issues are still relevant, you know, and we still have to um, think about how we can protect our own mental health and be able to build those relationships. And I loved what you said about having that open communication um, and really building those communication pathways ahead of time. Um, one of the things I know I work with my clients on uh, in pregnancy is let's start, you know, nurturing this relationship and really ensuring that we are building those communication pathways and, and strengthening those and working on how we can talk about things that aren't going well for us in a way that is easier to receive and be heard and all these things. And um, I'd love to get some of your maybe tips or tricks on how to um, really nourish those communication uh, skills. And, you know, I, I know you mentioned, you know, being very willing to be open and vulnerable. And I think that's one of the big pieces. Um, but I know that like with me, when I was really struggling, it was hard for me to voice what I was feeling. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit more too about that intuitive or not the intuitive piece, but just that more awareness that you had for your wife and what you kind of noticed. Um, that might help, you know, other partners out there who are like, well, something's going on, but I don't quite know what it is. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, something's, something's not quite right. Or, um, you know, any tips you have around, you know, one, strengthening those communication pathways and two, really what to look for in your partner when they are maybe struggling mentally. Mm -hmm. We all react to things differently and mm -hmm. it always depends on what the specific concern or issue or situation is. So right. I might, get some bad news and I might just shut my door for half an hour or some people will just completely shut themselves down really for, for long periods of time. And some people might go yeah. about like nothing happens and, and internally they're really struggling, but they're not showing it. So yeah. one of the biggest things when it comes to navigating that with your partner is, is knowing them and knowing how they yeah. react to things and, and knowing that it's not going to be the same reaction every single time either. If right. your, your partner, reacts the specific way for every single instance of something happening, that doesn't mean that the next one's going to happen the same way, especially with something mm -hmm. so significant, like dealing with uh, any kind of depressive symptoms after a pregnancy or dealing with raising children for the first time, whatever it might be. Right. Know your partner and know that you don't always know how they're going to be because we're mm -hmm. all human and it, it could very much depend on the day, the weather, the temperature, the time of day. And, and it, there's so many factors that could affect it. Mm -hmm. And when you have that little inkling, which most of us do, um, 
it's okay to ask. You know, I'm yeah. noticing that something's a little off or you seem a little down today or you seem a little agitated. Did something happen? Can we talk about it? And you may not always get that immediate open welcoming response and mm -hmm. be okay with that too, because that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with the relationship. That doesn't mean there's something necessarily wrong with your partner either. Right. In their own mind, they're trying to navigate and figure out and untangle what they're going through. And sometimes they might need a moment, they might just mm -hmm. kind of step back themselves and just, you know, I'm going to lay on the bed for 20 minutes and just read a book or something and get my mind off of this. And then we can talk after I've felt a little better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the big thing too. And you know, maybe I'm, I'm talking a little more about myself than I'd like to admit, but really yeah. knowing that, that it's okay to not be able to get through to somebody immediately, because that's not yeah. indicative of what your entire relationship is. It's more of just a reflection of what that specific moment or concern is. Mm -hmm. So approaching your partner, reaching out to them, even just that act alone is showing that you're you're invested, you care, you recognize that something's wrong, and you want to be there to help them through it. And vice versa, yeah. be accepting of them coming to you if you are struggling. I think of times where I could get significantly upset at something and I just I tense up and I'm like, I don't even want to talk to anybody for the next 20 minutes. Yeah, that's OK. Leave me alone for 20 <laughs> minutes. I will come to you in 20. I assure you. Um, mm -hmm. But that also kind of uh, wraps itself into that whole trust area, too, because if mm -hmm. your partner is saying, I need this time alone, you have to trust them to do that. They're their own person. They know what's going to work best for them in that moment. Yeah. And even if they don't, that's OK. This is what they need right now. And then you can, again, come back together and figure things out when you're both in, in a better state of mind. But yeah be okay with being pushed away a little bit because again we're we're all our own individual person and we have our own needs and sometimes we need that space absolutely yeah i i definitely agree with that and you know i think one of the things that and this is speaking personally with my own relationship but you know my husband is very action oriented very like fixer right like he wants to be able to find a solution when there's a problem I think we can all relate to that, but yeah, you know, guilty. one of the big things, <laughs> yeah. And one of the big things that we had to learn together was sometimes there's no solution, right? Sometimes there's no way to fix it. And so one of the things that, you know, really worked once we kind of figured out what was going on was just feeling seen and heard about your experience, not necessarily trying to fix the problem. Right. And I think that that, is really really big when somebody is struggling with depression there are ways to heal and get better and you do absolutely have options to get the help that you need when you're struggling with mental health um but sometimes too there there's just those moments where you are just feeling that feeling and you just need somebody to validate that feeling to see you um and to sit there with you you know and hold that for you um, and I think that that's one of my biggest things that I try to encourage partners is really sometimes they don't want a solution. They just want to feel seen and heard. Um, and I don't know if you have anything more to add to that, but I think that's one of the big things that really changed things with my husband and I when I was struggling. <laughs> that's good. And, you know, that speaks so much to the relationship you have with your husband that you two were mm -hmm. able to figure that out together and get to this place where sometimes you, you know, you can't be Mr. Fix it with everything. And right. I, I have those moments too. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Mm -hmm. Let's fix it. Um, right. But like any of us, we need that, that ability to just vent or just to be heard or to really felt like, uh, to really feel like that we've been listened to. And it's not just mm -hmm. the other person waiting for their turn to speak. Right. So if you're not getting that and you're feeling like you're just talking to a brick wall, it's not going to make you feel any better. It's not going to help you through that moment. It's not going to help the two of you figure out what's going on. It's just going to put up the wall even higher or mm. build those bricks even thicker. And we don't want that. Mm. So okay. I'm 100% with you that sometimes you just got to talk and get it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Was there anything else that you wanted to share around, you know, how partners can be that more supportive presence or, you know, things that they could maybe even do ahead of time to understand more about mental health and the, you know, perinatal time frame and um, what to look for, what to do, anything like that along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I think about what we went through with both of our, our children. So our first one, Michael, was he wasn't complicated, but at the very end, there were some complications with the actual birth. 
Um, mm. He wasn't coming naturally that she was induced. And I remember before we even went to the hospital, we had gone for her last checkup and we were expecting to go a couple days later uh, mm. to actually go into the hospital and go through the whole process. Instead, we went to the checkup and the doctor's like, well, I'm calling the hospital. You should go there in about two hours. Go get something to eat and you're you're going. So it was wow. like, you know, ready, let's go, let's go. Um, right. And everything. I mean, thankfully, they both were, were born healthy, no issues. Everything was great. But yeah. Michael was initially going to be a natural birth. It wound up having to be a C-section because he wasn't coming, you know, mm. and the induction wasn't working. And it was it was a very long period of time after they just said, let's let's just let's get him out of there. Yeah. Nicholas, we were a little more prepared for that, and we scheduled a C-section for for him, and it was a lot smoother. We knew what to expect because, again, it was also our second our second child. So my wife was prepared for everything with the hospitalization, and it was much smoother. And again, thank God they are healthy and happy. Yes. But as we were going through the first pregnancy specifically, there was a lot of new information for us um, mm -hmm. amongst our age group and our immediate siblings and family members. There's not a lot of kids around. Um, mm -hmm. I have a couple of friends, one I've known since high school. They have kids about the same age and a couple months older. Um, so we got to see a little bit vicariously of what they went through when they were going through their pregnancy. But when we were going through ours, it really was just us. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a lot of learning that we did together and a lot of you know, researching and going to the library and checking out those what to expect when you're expecting books. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and I think that helped us by doing it together. It wasn't mm -hmm. just my wife sitting at home looking through these books and, and Googling all these different things. It was us going through it together and discussing, yeah. you know, what can you really expect and what are the complications and when things would would come up at the uh, at the sonogram she would go to as minor as they were. We're like, oh, let's look a little into this and see if it's really something to worry about. And mm -hmm. that would help us because I, I'm I'm somebody who likes to to learn about things. So if there's something mm -hmm. I don't know about, it's like, oh, let me check it out. And and of course, today with with smartphones, you can find any bit of information any second of the day, without right. you know, giving it any thought. <laughs> so that helps me, but it also is distracting. And that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> right. Um, but having that ability to find this information and to speak to our doctors and, and, and really get some information together really helped us build up that that strength that we needed for when we ultimately did have Michael and, and then Nicholas. And, and again, you can't expect or prepare for everything, but at least it gave mm -hmm. us a little bit of an understanding of, of what's coming. And I think setting that up with partners prior to the actual birth is great. Mm -hmm. it, it gives you that opportunity to learn together and you find out things like how much uh, is available at your library for your kids when they're a little older. I mean, we have a mm -hmm. wonderful library that's like a mile away from us, huge playrooms and toys, and you can rent book uh, 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 movies. And, and it's, it's a wonderful resource for kids going really from, from as young as, you know, a year old all the way through their teens. And yeah. as somebody who never used my library that much, I had no idea it was that, that wonderful. So yeah. now we bring them there and Hey, go play for 20 minutes and then we'll get some books we could take home with us. And, yeah. But but those are the things you discover in your community because now you have a different perspective. It's not just you and your partner, or it's not just you. Now right. you got these little ones you got to figure out. And you know how are you going to keep them busy, or how are you going to teach them things, or how are you going to show them the world and get them socialized? Right. And I think doing that together before is is absolutely the best way to set yourselves up to being able to handle things together after or during. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That's like one of my biggest things, you know, for this platform, like the empowering piece comes from knowledge, right? It comes from feeling prepared in in the most way that you can be like we have both, you know, <laughs> admitted you can't always prepare for everything, but at mm -hmm. least you can come in to the situation with the knowledge that you can knowing you have worked on nourishing that relationship, worked on your communication pathways with your partner really feeling like a team so that you enter parenthood together um, is such a strength uh, when it comes to the challenges that we can face mm -hmm. um, during pregnancy, during postpartum, during everything beyond, right? It's like, I always tell my clients, like birth is not like, it, it, it seems to be like um, a marriage, right? Or a wedding, like it's the big event, right? And we all mm -hmm. prepare for the big event, the birth. And then we kind of forget about everything that happens after, right? And it's like, yep. birth is just the beginning. Like, you know, it, it really is. And um, 
the work that we do together in pregnancy and in early postpartum sets the foundation for our parenthood together, right? And really it, it gives that strength. It's never too late. It's never mm -hmm. too late to work on, you know, the things that we might be struggling with afterward. But um, I loved also what you said about understanding the resources in your community, because I think that that's another big piece that can be applied to a lot of different areas um, preparing to become a parent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your example is the library. Also finding um, places where you can, you know, be among other parents, you know, especially in cases like yours and in mine, I was the first of my friend group to have children. So I didn't have that piece of community that understood what I was going through. Um, so finding those people um, who know what you're going through, who are going through a similar experience um, and those resources can be really beneficial ahead of time, especially because you have more of that mindfulness. You're not as exhausted. You're not up 24 hours a day caring for a newborn yeah. trying to figure out who can help me, you know, like, what are my resources? Um, yep. So really yep. kind of checking into that ahead of time can be hugely beneficial, um, as well as for mental health. So I always encourage my clients, you know, know your, uh, your insurance benefits, if you have insurance, what does that look like as far as mental health services go? Um, I even go as far as, you know, identify a couple of therapists in your community who are familiar with perinatal mental health and might be accepting clients um, or that you feel a good connection to, um, have them, you know, on the back burner there in case you need them. Because if you've already kind of done that legwork, it makes getting the help so much easier, like when, if and when you need it. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know I, I've talked about this a lot with a lot of clients, and a lot of people over the years. That stigma of therapy, it's its certainly gotten better in society, but it's still there. Yeah, There's still there. that, you know, some people feel like it's its an admission of weakness or failure if they go to mm -hmm. a therapist. Or why should I talk to a complete stranger about these things that mm -hmm. may, they may not even have experienced themselves, which brings mm -hmm. me all the way back to my interning days when I would have, I, I remember this one particular couple, they were both retired and they were having marital mm -hmm. issues and they sat in front of me and it was, you know, late 20s and well, what do you know about a marriage of 40 right. years? I'm like, yeah, you're right. I don't know. I, you know not right. yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm knowledgeable. I'm educated and blah, blah, blah. I won them over, thankfully. But um, when it comes to therapy, there's a lot of, of unknowns for the people seeking therapy. And yeah. I always try to phrase it in a way where if you're starting to seek out therapists, see if they have some kind of consultation or initial mm -hmm. session that they'll do with you. Um, some of them will even do it shorter than a full session, like a quick 15 minute mm -hmm. phone call or video chat, which video is much more acceptable nowadays than pre COVID too. Right. Um, and get a feel for them. Think of it like you're interviewing the therapist, because if mm -hmm. you're going into therapy with somebody that you're not connecting with or clicking with, or at least getting somewhat of a good feeling about, <clears throat> excuse me, then your therapy is just not going to be beneficial to you. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll be yeah. sitting in that, that room just, what is this person saying? They don't know what I'm going through. They don't know how to help me out. And then you're just right. spinning your wheels and, and not getting the help that you really are looking for. So you're yeah. interviewing them. It's not them trying to find out about you, at least in that first session. And mm -hmm. once you feel a little more comfortable, then obviously you can open up. But and and the other thing which I had already mentioned is that feeling of it being an admission of weakness or failure, which it mm -hmm. absolutely is not. We yeah. all have moments and and issues and concerns that we need some extra help with and it's okay to reach out for that extra help whether yeah. it's through family or friends or professional um my i have a, a family member who works in new hampshire who who has built her practice around helping people with eating disorders and she's been doing that mm. for quite a few years and i think if i knew somebody who had some kind of concern like that i would want them to work with somebody who knows what they're doing you know, yeah. it's, it's a hard thing to deal with and, and having a professional, even if it's for a short amount of time, you're just going to somebody who's knowledgeable, who has the education and who has that experience who can yeah. put you in the right direction and not to say all therapists are wonderful and perfect, but I think mm -hmm. we're a pretty good lot. And yeah. again, if you don't mesh with somebody that doesn't mean therapy isn't for you, it just means maybe that connection isn't there. And, and yeah. that helps kind of erode that stigma a little bit more too, knowing that you're much more in control of the therapy than you realize. Yeah, no, I love that that perspective because I do think that that 
is a little scary for people seeking help or or the thought of idea of just sitting in a room with a complete stranger and just like here's all my trauma like mm-hmm. let's lay it yeah. on the table <laughs> like that does not feel good you know for yeah. a lot of us and so it's mm-hmm. like we need to build that comfort um that connection and make sure we feel good about that relationship and similarly to doctors right um a lot of folks that I work with, they just stick with a provider that maybe they don't feel um, supported by and because they feel like they don't have a choice in who they work with. And really, you know, the whole point of this platform is to empower birth givers and families to say, like, what I'm experiencing matters, how I experience my birth and my postpartum matters. And um, prioritizing my needs through this time is one of the most important things that I can do. And finding those supports that encourage that is super, super important. So yeah, interview your therapists, interview your doctors, (laughs) and know that you have the power to say, this isn't a good fit. Like, Mm -hmm. and that's okay, you know? So yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you said about that. Because I think a lot of people don't realize that that they're in control of that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And do a little, little research too. I mean, you know, yeah. maybe, you know, somebody who's been to therapy and maybe they really enjoy their therapist. So, you know, maybe yeah. you can see if they have availability or, you know, there's, there's websites out there. You can check, you know, you can even just Google somebody and get a little bit of a feel for what they do and where they're located. And even that yeah. can help you feel a little more normalized because, Oh, this is a real person. They're, they're at 100 main street and I know exactly where that is. So I'm going to go check right. them out and, you know, it's okay to do a little bit of research and it's okay to find that something's not working for you and, and try something a little different. Yeah, absolutely. We got a little off topic around the partners supporting, but I think that <laughs> this is a, it's all related. It all ties it's together. Building, yeah. It does. And building that support village, you can't have mm-hmm. one person be your everything, right? And mm-hmm. I think that that's something really, really, really important for all of us to remember, um, especially during times like this of immense change where so often we view our partners and they're very, very key to our mental health, right? And our support system, but they can't be our everything. So building that village of different professional supports, um, family supports, friends, all those things um, is really, really key because nobody can be your everything. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> very know? true. And and yeah. that's why I always say, like I said before, it's okay to reach out for that extra help. And Yes. And be aware too of what your partner's going through because they could be going through the same things that you're going through, or they could be going yeah. through something completely different. But you having that awareness and and trying to connect with them and reach out to them and and even discuss different things that you can try to do. Maybe couples therapy is going to be helpful for you too at that moment, mm-hmm. just to help yeah. navigate these things. But again, it all comes back to to listening and having that awareness and and knowing that they just want to be heard, just like you want to be heard too. Yes, absolutely. And, and something that just you said just kind of sparked my, my mind around, um, you know, and this is, a, they think a very low estimate, but I believe it's isn't it 10% of um, male partners experience depression in the postpartum time frame? I believe it's something around that. Like yeah, 10%. I think you're Yeah, I think, but I think, I think that's that, that, but and I think it's really low is because they, they yeah. think that a lot of obviously a lot of people are still um, it's a taboo thing for them to speak mm-hmm. about. But It is important. And something that I tell my clients too is, you know, your partner is experiencing their own version of postpartum as well. Right. And so understanding that it might, it's obviously not the exact same thing because the birth giver is going through a lot more of the physical stuff and the, you know, physiological changes and all these things. But, um, you know, having that empathy for each other and understanding that you're both going through this huge change and transition, um, it brings you a little closer and I, I think it, it helps you have that empathy and that ability to hold and hear the things that your partner wants to share and needs to share with you. Um, and I think that that's a, a really important thing for all of us to keep in mind as well. Yeah. There were absolutely those moments where one of us would just be breaking down crying because it was so difficult and we we're having so much stress related to everything. And, and while the baby's happily playing with the toys in the other room, we're like, Oh, we're terrible parents. We're not this, we're not that. And, and being able to be there for each other through those moments, even if yeah. we didn't have the solutions, like you said, not being able to fix everything in the moment, but just being there mm-hmm. for each other and holding each other. And it's okay. And, and pointing out those positives that are getting lost amongst all that dark cloud of negativity yes. that can even just 
part those clouds a little bit because it's you start to think well, we did do this and and we are acting this way and and it it makes me think too um i was discussing this with my wife just a little bit last night too uh she struggled a lot with the breastfeeding and that was something that yes. really was was really tough for her feeling like mm. she can't physically do something that so many moms can do and right. that was a big thing that we really had to talk through a lot and and I tried to help assure her that, that there's a lot higher percentage of women that can't or don't breastfeed than, it, you know, it's kind of similar and that it might be underreported. It depends how comfortable people right. are talking about it. But that doesn't mean that's a failure on her part. It's just yeah. something that is just not doable at this point for whatever the reason. Um, and that doesn't mean that you don't love him any less. That doesn't mean you can't care for him any less or or take care of him or feed him or anything like that. We just have to switch it up a little bit and just be a little more mindful of uh, how much we're giving him and talking with the doctor. Again, everything went, went great. Thank goodness. But that was a really emotional uh, stress for her because yes. it really felt like a failure on her part in every way. And right. I would certainly do anything I could to try to help her out of it, but those emotions are strong and, and they can hit you pretty hard. Yeah, absolutely. That was a big part of my experience as well was my struggling with my breastfeeding journey with my first son. Um, and that absolutely contributed to my mental health state because yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's a shame because, and I think we're getting better about talking about, you know, how breastfeeding is a learned skill, right? But when I came into this, I didn't have any friends to reference. I didn't know, you know, and it was very um, something that I had no idea about. I thought, oh, well, you know, once the baby's here, it'll just be this natural, easy thing. And it was not <laughs> at all. Yeah. Um, and so something to keep in mind is that, you know, it is a learned skill for both you and your baby. Your baby's never fed that way before either, mm -hmm. just because they might have some, you know, innate knowledge somewhere, you know, in their DNA that, oh, okay, I smell the milk. I know that that's where I need to go. It doesn't mean that they know how to latch. It doesn't mean that they know, you know, anything about it. And so you're learning together and really try to remove that pressure of doing it right and perfect every, you know, right away, because parenting in general is a learned skill and we don't know anything about it. And even if we are second, third, fourth, fifth time parents and beyond, each child is different. And so you're going to have knowledge and skills that you acquire along the way with each pregnancy and each child. But, you know, it's always going to be a learning curve for sure. Yeah. And that's one of those instances, too, where I couldn't I literally could not relate yeah. to that because I wasn't the one providing, you know, the, the breastfeeding or anything like that. And my body's yeah. not wired that way. And I was seeing it from the outside. And all I could think was, how can I help her through this? Because yeah. I can't. I can't say that I know exactly what she's going through, but I could sympathize. I could be there. I could just get her through those, those moments as best as I could. And, and that's where a little bit of that, that fix it side comes in. It's like, okay, we can't do yeah. this. Let's come up with another solution and, and see what's right. going to work. And, and that also makes me think too, it was uh, during that whole, that whole period of time where, where he was growing up, we had the, uh, the formula crisis where all of a sudden there's, oh, there's, my gosh. Yeah, everybody's struggling just to buy formula yeah. for their children and trying to make sure mm -hmm. they're fed. And I remember even talking to our pediatrician, like, you know, what do we do here? You know, we yeah. have enough. We'll be OK for the time being. But what happens long term if this keeps going on? And, you know, that that becomes another conversation that you have to navigate you know, to make right. sure that your child's getting the nutrition that they need. And, and and that also added to her feeling like, how come I can't just do this myself? And And yeah, that was, you know, something we really tried to get through together and, and thankfully we did, but it was a lot of, a lot of communication and a lot of trust and a lot of opening up that vulnerability. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a beautiful thing to recognize, you know, too, is that sometimes, you know, I know from my personal experience was I just needed to hear it was hard. Like that validation of this is really hard and this sucks because this was something you held really close to your heart and it's something you wanted to do so badly. And it is not easy right now for you, you know, and just being able to be like, yeah, thank you. Like, I'm not crazy. Like, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. like hearing that instead of, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? You know, like all the things that yeah. people with good intention wanted to help me with, but mm -hmm. you know, instead it was just like, I just need to hear that this is hard and that, you know, whatever I need to do as far as a decision to be made, it's not, it's not the, um, 
you know, my breastfeeding journey isn't the whole of my parenting experience, right? How much milk you're able to produce does not equate to how good of a parent you are or, you know, how nourishing you are to your child in other ways. And so being able to understand that, to acknowledge that, you know, and be able to just know that I was supported and heard with my struggles was such a key piece um, to that part of the journey that I was not expecting to be difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, she certainly wasn't either. And, and yeah. it was, it was a curveball. but the nice thing about having prepared ahead of time and, and trying to keep those communication lanes open throughout everything is that once we got out of the woods and, and you look back on it, you know, this is now four years later, four and a half years yeah. since he was born. And we see this kid running around, kicking the soccer ball and playing with his yeah. little brother and he's this happy little kid and you know he he tells the weirdest jokes but i think they're funny <laughs> uh, and you think back like remember what we went through and and mm -hmm. it almost strengthens that that ability for you to, to continue um building up that great relationship because you look at what you went through together and what you navigated and, and the problems you solved or the problems you didn't solve but you come to the end you know not the end it's really the beginning of everything but the end of that dark cloud period, you know, it, you look back yeah. on it and go, we did this together and, and we created this wonderful situation for, for our family. And, and yes. it was tough and that's okay to acknowledge that. And it's okay to acknowledge that you, you did good too. Yeah. I love that too. You know, pointing out the resilience in the difficulty and recognizing that in yourself and in your relationship is, is what keeps that hope, you know, and it's like, okay, it is really hard right now. And this is the hardest thing I've ever gone through and things are really dark, but there's also, I think not the, but, but the, and right. That's some of the things that I try mm. to talk to my clients about shifting perspective on is it's okay to have and hold two experiences at the same time. And I think a lot of times we have to be like, Oh, because I'm struggling with postpartum depression, everything is going to just always be this bad and it's horrible. And I, you know, but does it need to be there? Right. It's like, yes, that's true. And you love sitting and holding your baby and you were able to learn how to change a diaper like a champ. And you were able to, <laughs> you know, give a, a few ounces of breast milk, you know, when they were first born or whatever that is like really, um, honoring the and and holding both experiences kind of gets us through the dark times. <laughs> yes, like. yes, it does. And I know it's, it's hard to keep that in mind too, when it you're is. in those dark spots, because it it's so overwhelming and it just builds up and builds up and rolls around in your head. And you just want to lay down and go to sleep for 14 hours. But yes, I, you know, I, I would encourage anybody just know that there are moments in time that you can kind of, hold together and say, you know what, it's not so bad in this particular moment. This can get you through until the next one, or think a little further ahead. Like we are going to get through this. The, the baby's going to learn how to sleep in his crib alone at some point. And, yeah. you know, he's going to be able to dress himself and we're not going to have to worry about diapers anymore. And mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's okay to think a little forward and, and latch onto that and just say, you know, this might be hard, but it's going to be worth it. Even if it doesn't feel like it in this particular moment, it will down the yeah. road. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's somewhere too where your, our partners can help, you know, help us see that when we are in the trenches and we are the one experiencing, you know, depression or anxiety or whatever perinatal health disorder we might be struggling with. Um, having them there, not the toxic positivity. Let's not, let's not mm -hmm. do that. That's not where we want to go. But nope. having them recognize our strengths sometimes can be super helpful. Like, oh my gosh, like, way to go you know you were able to have him on the breast for five minutes and last time it was only three like awesome like that's two more minutes you know and recognizing those strengths recognizing those achievements can sometimes be so much easier from the partner perspective than the person who's super struggling right so i i definitely think that that's one area partners can be super supportive in is recognizing those strengths and those accomplishments yeah i love that and pointing out those little steps forward yeah. there's still steps forward, even if it's the mm -hmm. tiniest thing. Like you said, if it's three minutes last time with the breastfeeding, now you did five yeah. minutes. Well, it's only two minutes, but no, you just yeah. did something and, and, and did it better and did it more. And, and that's a good thing to acknowledge. Yeah. It's okay to, to take out the little things and go, good job. You know? Yeah. Eventually you'll hit the big goals, but no, we're not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're not, we're not, especially when it comes to parenting. We have so many 
preconceived motion, uh, you know, notions of being the perfect parent, you know, and mm -hmm. what that means or what we've seen that mean in the movies or, you know, on social media or whatever. And the, the reality is, is that's just not reality. You know, it's, it's messy and it's imperfect and it's exact, you're exactly the parent that your child needs. And, and being able to recognize that is really empowering. Amen. Totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness, we could talk about this all, all day. And I've oh, yeah. been loving yeah. our conversation. Um, yeah. But I was wondering, do you have any other last minute words of encouragement or pieces of, of advice for, you know, partners or birth givers or anybody going through this crazy journey we call parenthood? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the biggest thing that, that we both learned was we're going to make little mistakes and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, the mistakes aren't going to last for the next 18 years of their life and be... Mm -hmm shared with a therapist, you know, for the rest of their <laughs> adult lives, little things happen. We make a little mistake. We didn't, you know, we didn't realize maybe he was hungry overnight instead of needing a diaper or mm -hmm. he took a little tumble off of the bed for the first time he tried to lay on a bed. And yeah. if, if they're not bleeding, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're we really heard it. that. <laughs> yeah. We heard that, that noise once he was in his room and it was the first time he just decided to climb out of his crib. You know, it was, I forget how old yes. he was, maybe about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Those things happen. <laughs> you can't control everything. And, and it's okay to learn from those mistakes. And that doesn't mean that you've permanently damaged your child. It doesn't mean you've permanently affected your relationship. It's a little speed bump you're going to get through. And, and we all go through them in different ways. Yes, absolutely. Oh my gosh. So yeah. funny you shared the crib thing. I definitely had that same experience. I'm like downstairs doing something. I just hear this thud. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, and yep. It, oh, yep, sure enough, he learned how to climb out. It's like, well, I'm yep. in the bed. <laughs> yep, yep. That's exactly you know? what we went through. <laughs> But it's true. It's like in those moments, like like I said before, it's a learning curve, right? We've yes. never gone through that specific experience with this child before. And they're their own person and they're developing in their own way and their own speed. And so, you know, a yeah. lot of parenthood is reactionary. There are things mm -hmm. we can prepare for. But at the same time, it's like we just got to learn from each of those experiences, each of those mistakes and give ourselves some grace for goodness sakes. This is hard. Yes. Yes. <laughs> You're doing your best. I'm sure any parent is just doing their yeah. best and, and it, it might come with those little speed bumps here and there, but we can always drive over them and keep moving forward. Yes, exactly. It's just a speed bump. It's not a, you know, it's not a blockade. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> we don't just stop being a parent because we made a mistake. No, no, right? no, no. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, this was so insightful. Thank you so very much. Um, and if you, you. want to, you know, connect with you um, out in the wonderful world of the internet or anywhere else, where can they find you? So you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at MJM Wellness NY. Uh, you can also go to my website, which is www.mjmwellnessny.com. We have a blog up there with different posts of different mental health topics. Uh, we're starting to post our own little podcast that we're putting together where we're speaking with other mental health professionals and wellness professionals of all different fields. Uh, you could also get our contact information and set up an appointment directly on the website if anybody's interested in therapy or even just a free consultation. And um, yeah, we're, we're always open to hearing people's thoughts. And if anybody's interested in therapy or has any questions about therapy, you know, we're always reachable. Awesome. That's exciting about the podcast. That'll be a fun yeah. adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll definitely keep an eye on that once it's up and running. Do you guys have it published yet? Or are you just starting to record the episodes? We yeah. just posted our first episode. I think it went live <laughs> yesterday. So we have a few more in the bank and yeah. we're going to try to do like say 10 a season, give ourselves a couple of months to recollect ourselves and start it all yeah. again. So they oh, should be posting uh, once a week. Uh, actually, like I said, just starting yesterday. So that's great. I'll we'll have to check it out for sure. What's the name of the podcast? It is Chat About That with Matt because we had to make awesome. it rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? You always have yeah, to it it's fun. on Spotify and, <laughs> and uh, Apple Podcasts right now as well. So you can search for it and find it directly that way. Yeah, sounds like a great resource. And I really appreciate our wonderful conversation. And I think that this was hopefully one of those beacons of light in a really dark, challenging time that people either have gone through are currently going through or might want to prepare for. Nobody wants postpartum depression. Nobody expects to get it, but it, you know, it can happen. And I think it's important to feel prepared and to understand that you're not alone and that you can get well 
and that there are resources out there for you. And so um, thank you for taking the time to chat with me about that, Matt. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, thank you. And yeah, this has been such an insightful episode for sure. Um, and, you know, everybody watching, I just want to remind you that Empowering Postpartum Coaching guides new and pregnant moms and birth givers through the transition into your parenthood so that you can bond with your baby without sacrificing your own self-care. And if this is what you're waiting or wanting out of your own postpartum experience, then I'm on Instagram. You can see my handle here at empowering underscore postpartum. Shoot me a DM and we can chat about how I can support you through your journey. And also remember that this show can be heard on the Spanglish Radio Network. Please check out spanglishworld.ca for all the news and programming. Spanglish World, watch it, hear it, read it, download it, and live it. And we will see you all next week again for another episode of Empowering Postpartum. And we hope that you have a great week. Thank you so much again, Matt.